Okay, it's a very good afternoon. Welcome. I, I, I know it's a Friday afternoon, so <laughs> we'll go through this in as, I guess, as brief and as fun a way as we can. Um, since we, we're now in April, we are looking at the AI challenge. In this week, we're looking at building an artificial intelligence practice. So one of the things that I've been sort of thinking about uh, as I as I address the idea that you want to build a practice is essentially not to sort of be able to sit here and stand and say that um, in order to build a practice you must do X or you must do Y because you're probably going to find with the, the, within the AI world that there are heaps of different angles that you can approach this from and a lot of the approach will be about the customers. So as we walk through this, kind of just try and keep it in, in your heads that we are talking about AI. In many ways, it is a platform of different services that we see as AI, rather than trying to think AI and only AI. Because I think one of the mistakes that many people tend to make with artificial intelligence is that this is the assumption that it's just about autonomous cars. Uh, there are a lot of components that make up AI, and there are a lot of processes that can benefit from AI from very large to very small. So when you look at this from a what sort of practice can I build, what sort of IP can I wrap up, and which sort of customer can I talk to, it is important that you see this from a global perspective and not a, you know, if they aren't building cars, I don't really have anything for them. So let's just catch up initially. Uh, with where we are, so uh, many of you have been w with us for the all the all of the weeks, and uh, we started with the basic hello and how are you and welcome to the program. There was a session uh, you guys went through on licensing and uh, partner network benefits. We talked a couple of weeks ago around becoming an AI master, and I emphasised even then that uh, you know AI is made up of a number of different pieces that come from all angles. And it's important that you, you sort of investigate those pieces, that you understand the stack, and that you kind of find your niche and you find the place where you already potentially have some skills, where you potentially can really um, blossom and develop tools. And now we're starting to look at it more from an industry-focused perspective and a building IP perspective. And this is where you really start to Apologies, I seem to I seem to have been kicked off there for a second, uh, but I hope I'm back. I hope everybody is able to hear me. If there are any you're problems, back, obviously. Yep, okay, thank you. <clears throat> if there are any problems, please uh, reach out uh, to the chat window or something like that. If if anyone else is suffering the problems I just suffered, so. Going forward, we're looking at how we can build an AI practice, how we sort of approach this idea um, of AI. One of the things that we have to be aware of right from the get-go is that we're essentially witnessing a bit of a revolution. Okay? And the revolution is largely driven by a bunch of people that I like to call data, data natives. Uh, these data natives were we can call them millennials, we can um, essentially call them whatever we want really, but we're looking at people who are essentially born with technology in their hands. Okay? And they have an expectation that the world is going to be smart and that the world will consistently adapt to a particular taste or a particular set of habits. Okay? The Native technologies that data natives are using is essentially about what does technology do for me? Okay. Um, it's not enough for something to be digital. It's not enough for something to be purely responsive. It has to be both of those two plus personalized, context sensitive, okay. and ultimately it needs to add 
to a digital native's life. People like me, who essentially I see as what we call di digital immigrants, sort of came along pre-everything digital and now essentially sit in this place where we use it, but I'm equally satisfied with my phone being a phone and satisfied with things just enhancing my life rather than having an expectation that if it's going to be digital, it better be good. So as we move with that mindset, we have to look at, the, at a few things when it comes to building a practice. One, that when we build this practice, we're making some choices, but we're also asking our customers to make some choices. We then need to look at what we need from a partner perspective in order to start building out a AI practice or building out IP. The next step is obviously to take this to the customer, get some buy-in, get some engagement, and then at the end of it, being able to measure what makes what we've done for them successful, how is what we've done something that contributes to their success. So I always go back to this particular quote from Harry Shum. And in this case, I'm really just looking at, at the first part of the, of the quote. And that is that AI will transform every business. We can go on to the improve every life, solve some of society's most fundamental challenges. But the fact that he states that it will transform every business is really important. And that goes in this, in this that goes to ultimately the idea of new technologies and of what AI has inspired. Okay. And one of the things that we see as AI inspiring is this idea of there is this fear of missing out. Right. And what I tend to find with companies that I work for, it's a case of AI for the sake of AI. And it's one of the things that we have to be cautious of, right? It's one of the things that makes AI and the message that you take to partners, um, sorry, to customers, really, really important because it goes to this idea that <clears throat> AI for the sake of AI is not going to make anybody uh, any better off, right? So it's led to this idea where people fear missing out, missing the bus, not being able to catch up and that kind of stuff, and may just want AI for the sake of AI. There is also the fear and uncertainty and doubt. So it's FOMO and FUD, right, where essentially people are scared of AI. They're not really sure what AI is. They're uncertain about what it brings. There is this concern that, you know, AI is going to take over the world. We're going to reach singularity. We're all in trouble. So there's an element of doubt. Why do I want it? Why do I need it? What does it do for me? And then the other thing that AI has inspired, and this is just a, sort of from a comical point of view, is uh, a lot of feuds, as in the Elon Musk basically saying that Zuckerberg's understanding of the future of AI is limited. I sort of found that, and I thought that was really apparent right now, given what has happened um, with people's data and how it was used in the context of, of both Facebook and um, and the, the analytics company in the UK. But I'm not going to go there. I just want you guys to understand that we're talking about a lot of things that sort of make up an environment that, that sparks fear, it sparks doubt, uncertainty, causes feuds. The important thing with all of this, though, is that industry is paying attention. So whether we like it or not, AI is starting to permeate everything we do. It's starting to permeate every industry. It is starting to become very, very important in the context of the way we operate, how we operate, when we operate, and how we will implement going forward. What it does lead us to from a customer perspective is customers need to make a choice. Now, say customers need to make a choice. But I'll take that right down to partners need to make a choice. The reality going forward is that businesses will need to become intelligent or be intelligent businesses, or they will struggle and potentially cease to exist. We're really just saying that with the influx of AI, with the intelligence that comes with AI, with the automation, 
with the predictive capabilities, with the forecasting, that any company that isn't doing this is going to struggle to maintain any competitive uh, level with companies that are doing this going forward. Okay. Behind that, artificial intelligence technologies will change how we function. And as a result, businesses are prepared, need to be prepared to change as well. Now, I'm not for a moment saying that if you guys come to work on Monday, everything's going to be different and we, you know, the way we function will be different. But I am saying that as artificial intelligence, as AI, as machine learning, as cognitive services permeate what we do and how we do it, we will start to find that what we currently maybe do manually will become automated. The way we currently determine if something is hot or cold or, uh, you know, anything like that, that will change pretty soon as well. And then we have to deal with the reality of all this. And the reality is that most company, companies are not ready for artificial intelligence. Okay. It's our job going forward then to make them ready. It's our job to essentially say, <clears throat> we now have the knowledge, we, we have the resources, we have the IP, we have the capability, we have ideas to help you move forward, to help you to start, to start integrating AI into what you do. Okay. So every business needs to start working on becoming an intelligent business. Okay. And that really goes to the fact that if we looked at every enterprise now, you'd probably find that every enterprise is a digital enterprise. If they aren't, they're probably struggling. We have to apply the same mechanism as we go forward with uh, artificial intelligence. The important thing to realize is that an AI strategy as an AI strategy is not going to take you anywhere. Okay. It's an odd managerial notion and it's not some magic voodoo that you just sprinkle over everything and it turns it into awesome. It has to be essentially messaged as something that needs work, that needs to be integrated, that needs to enhance the business rather than change the business. And then we take these choices forward and we start to essentially implement them for ourselves and for our customers. It means that at some stage we have to talk about the hype. Right? AI is, is, is kind of one of those much hyped umbrella terminologies that have come along over the past few years where the general consensus out there is that it's some sort of voodoo. Okay. But in many cases, the messaging has rather been a case of the tail wagging the dog or the cart before the horse type strategy. Okay. There is ultimately no magic source. You don't find anything that you just throw at a business and all of a sudden the business becomes better. What we do need is some sort of really solid strategy. It's important to work out how artificial intelligence can be used to help achieve you and your customers' goals rather than AI becoming the goal. Right. It's an important component that as we look at this, we recognize the fact that AI is not some magical source you just throw over everything and everything gets better, that we need to look at it in terms of how we can start achieving goals rather than AI being the goal. So it needs to be integrated. It needs to start permeating what we're doing. It needs to start becoming one of those things that we add to what we've already got. Okay. It's also then important to build on our strengths. Okay. Many of your customers, you as partners, will already have strengths. There will be things you do really well. And this is where you need to sort of sit back and look at how do I continue to do what I do and enhance it using all of the capabilities that artificial intelligence gives me. Okay. We need to fight against the temptation of plunging into things from an AI first perspective. Okay. We need to look at the strengths. We need to look at what we already have. We need to look at what we have. To, we currently do very well. And then we need to add an artificial intelligence or a machine learning twist to it. Okay. Applic artificial intelligence applications will make you work smarter, will allow you to take advantage of your data. 
It'll let you learn a little more about yourself. Apologies, guys. It looks like I got kicked out again. I am weirdly enough. I'm uh, here in the Microsoft sorry, hopefully office. John. It might be the Wi-Fi in Microsoft Office. Oh no, I'm actually hardwired. Okay. Weirdly enough. Okay. All right. Yeah, Kick I on. managed to. I managed to get them to make sure that I was hardwired. So, um, okay. So the there's, ultimately it's it's about learning. It's about improving on existing performance, it's about improving on past performance. Okay, it, it shouldn't be something that you don't comprehend that you feel you just need to put in because everyone else is doing it or because it needs to meet some sort of box that you want to check. This is also the message that ultimately you have to take to your customers. Okay, Build on the strengths we already have, transform what we, have, we already have, but in a better manner. Okay. And along the way, what will tend to happen is you'll come across products, you'll come across ideas, which will, uh, I, I, I'm afraid of using the word disrupt, but ultimately enhance, disrupt, improve, automate some of the practices that you already have in play, and then ultimately build a better business. Okay. So it's important that we understand why we're doing this, that why we want to do this, why we're taking it to customers, and also importantly that we move away from the hype that it's just about autonomous cars and, and things like this. Okay, so where do we start? Yeah. The common scenario that I face as a partner, as somebody who sort of advises people and, and does a lot of work in the AI space, okay, is that in spite of all the hype and excitement in the AI field, most customers do not have the planning in place, the infrastructure, and or the cloud capability to benefit from basic data science, let alone AI and machine learning. In other words, there is a lot that has to be done to bring customers into the AI world, and we as partners need to ensure we build practices to, to facilitate this. This is more of a sort of a, a feeling that I have, this is how I tend to analyze the current scenario that we have with AI in the Australian context. Now, I'm not for a moment saying that there is no AI. There are some companies out there that are doing amazing things in the AI space. Um, you know, if anybody watches football, if anybody watches rugby or rugby league, you'll notice that um, most players now carry smart, uh, now wear smart vests. They wear little um, uh, GPS trackers in uh, just between their shoulder blades in those smart vests. We're doing amazing work analyzing what players are doing, trying to keep them safe, trying to keep them healthy. We are doing, there is amazing stuff happening. Okay, there are logistics companies that are using AI for predictive purposes. There are, charities out there that are using it. I'm not for a moment saying that nobody's using it. I am referencing, though, that 60% of businesses out there that haven't looked at it, that don't consider it, that see AI from a autonomous cars perspective and essentially believe that it's something that is 20 years down the track. And our job now becomes a case of how do we take this to customers? How do we take this to people and give them an understanding of AI, give them the ability to start to integrate AI into what they do, give them a better understanding? What do they need to move forward with AI? What can we develop that allows them? Um, yeah, how, <clears throat> that's actually an interesting question that's just popped up. How many on the call have customers asking for AI? Uh, it would be interesting if, if people just sort of did a yes or a no and we got a sort of take uh, of percentage of people on the call and how many customers they have that are asking for AI. Because I'll tend, I think you'll tend to find that there's an interest, but really there isn't 
the infrastructure, there isn't the excitement, there isn't the planning to facilitate it. Okay, And as a result, this is largely because there is a lack of understanding. Most of the people I talk to post this particular comment, as in I go to a business and I say to them, how come you're trying to try and implement some AI? Um, they'll kind of go, because it's too expensive, because I'll need resources, I'll need a data scientist, I'll need this, I'll need a mathematician, I'll need a statistician. And I'm for which part? <laughs> and then they'll essentially will discuss a few problems, will discuss things that they may struggle with. And in many cases, it becomes a case of why don't we just try the simplest of all machine learning algorithms, right? Why don't we just try linear regression, see what that spits out, see what we get from it. Spin up an Azure machine learning studio, drop some data in, see what it spits out at the end. If it's something that you can use, you now have artificial intelligence, right? And it's cost you a total of 17 cents. This is, I know I'm, tr I'm trying to be amusing and I'm trying to be a little sort of funny about the scenario, but ultimately this is what we need to get people to understand. I think there is a lot of misinformation around what it takes to have a customer go from nothing to permeating some artificial intelligence, some machine learning, some data science into their environments. So from our perspective, we have to look at what we've got. Right. As a partner, you have to kind of go, where do I start? Okay. What have I already got? What do I need? How do I get it? And then how do I go about taking all of this that I've created and taking it off to the customer? Okay. So how do we use AI to get better at what we do as partners? And then how do we use AI to help customers to get better at what they do as well? So you'll tend to find that as a partner, you'll probably have some people with some existing skills. Once you've sat down and come up with the, the, the sort of channel within the AI umbrella that you'd like to work on, it's essentially then making sure you have the, the skills that are required in order to operate within that channel. So for, for instance, if it happens to be cognitive services, you're probably going to need a couple of developers. You're probably going to need a... Um, someone who can wire up a website. You're probably going to need somebody who can essentially run call APIs, create a web service, make that web service available to a customer, that sort of thing. Um, and you'll tend to find that these are things that you've done before. You're just doing it in a slightly different context with a slightly different level of understanding. That might come from having to train or upskill some of your staff. And that goes back to some of the resources we looked at when we looked at the AI masterpiece. It's important that you go to AI school, that you go to Learn Analytics, that you go to edX, that you look at some of the Microsoft official curriculum and you say, is this a way I can skill up? Okay. Essentially, how do I get to a point where I can do things better and then I can transfer that knowledge to customers or I can package that knowledge and resell it to customers? as a possible artificial intelligence solution. Okay. The important part is understanding the technologies. And by understanding of the technologies, I mean that we have to look at the fact that everything that we're going to do is essentially going to run through cloud services. It's going to give us access to things like cognitive services, machine learning, okay, the bot services. Never forget the importance of data in all of this, right? And, and one of the things we'll talk about in a second when we get to the customer piece is the customer's embracing of data literacy. We'll tend to find that you can have all the AI in the world. If you aren't feeding it good data, you're not going to get good predictions. You're not going to get good results. You're not going to get good solutions. So there needs to be, right at the get-go, this idea that in many cases, most of what we do initially with the customer is to ensure that they have some sort of data literacy, some sort of respect for their data that essentially allows them to put the business in the best possible position 
when starting to look at artificial intelligence tools or functionalities. So when it comes to the technologies, one of the things that you have to look at once again from a partner perspective and from a resources perspective is how are we tracking with the technologies that are available to us from an AI perspective? So, you know, if I was to take something machine learning, is there somebody within the company that already works with a bit of Azure machine learning? Is there somebody who kind of has a good take on a couple of algorithms? If I'm in the predictive world, then regression tends to be, you know, the, 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 uh, the algorithm or the set of algorithms of choice. So is there somebody that essentially is using these algorithms that understands how to build predictive models? And if I can build these predictive models, can I take data that I'm already harvesting, push it into this model, and it will tell me when something is going to happen? Very much along the lines of what I showed you guys a couple of weeks when we looked at you know, predicting car prices and things like that. It doesn't have to be about car prices. Okay, It can be anything. Just think. If think about your business, think about some of your customer businesses, right? How can we help them by simply predicting something? Now, I use this particular scenario because this, the idea of predicting something isn't new, right? In most cases, you'll find that most businesses, most of your companies have been doing this for decades, right? They call it financial predict projection. And whether they use some other set of tools, whether they use multiple Excel worksheets that are all connected and, and integrated with each other, what they've been trying to do for years and years and years is come up with some sort of methodology that allows them to ultimately come up with numbers for next year's budget, come up with numbers for how something should be paid for, come up with numbers for, um, you know, just so the business can, can continue to exist and, and exist successfully. It looks like it's ultimately going to throw me out every 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> so um, bear with me, guys. I'm not really sure. I'm, uh, I think I've done pretty much everything I can to not be thrown off, and it seems to be at a, a kind of defined interval. So there's maybe some – it looks like potentially someone has written some sort of in artificial intelligence um, <laughs> capability to get rid of me every 10 minutes, if that is the case. Um, thank you very much. But <laughs> no problem. Im Go ahead. Importantly, um, you know, it's about kind of understanding that businesses do these things. They've been doing it in a very different way, right? If I was to sort of consider things like, um, I'm, I'm going to take my daughter in this case, if she were to try and live her life, her Netflix life, without the recommendation engine that Netflix provides, I think she would be staring at the start screen for the rest of her life. We, we forget that these things are already part of our lives, that we've become very comfortable with recommendation engines. We've become very comfortable with the fact that we lean on a bunch of actuaries or accountants and just say to them, what's the number for next year's budget? We don't really consider how they do it. We don't really consider the fact that they probably are using some ridiculously complex and difficult mechanism for coming up with next year's budget. Or they are already using some sort of service that's out there that essentially does it for them, that probably has some algorithms built into it. Right. We have to essentially face the fact that it's permeating our lives, and if it isn't, we have to start making sure that it, that it does. So use the stack. Understand the roles. Okay. When we start talking about artificial intelligence, when we start talking about all the pieces that we're going to be using, it's not necessarily just about data sources, apps, sensors, devices, and then a process that that has to go through. You could be creating some sort of web interface that ultimately a customer can reach out to that does some sort of calculation for you. OK? 
Okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be artificial intelligence in its most complex form. It can simply be a case of if I plug A in here and B in there and I run it through a combination of C, D, and E, what does it spit out? And that might just be some computational number that certain businesses do. You know, an engineering firm might have some computation that is widely used that potentially changes according to some metric or some feature that you could wrap into a little service so that they plug in a number one side and they get a different number out on the other side. There's loads of different ways that we can look at this, so it's important also to understand the roles. Obviously, if we look at those pillars that we see there, everything starts with data, whether the data comes from sensors, devices, apps, or a SQL server. It then goes through a process of information management. So this might be your role. This is, might be what you do for your customers. Okay. It might go through big data stores. It might go through a processing piece. That could be your role. That could be what you do for the customer. It could be both. It could be all of it. Right. You might be the guys who do the machine learning, do the analytics, okay, or apply the intelligence, the bot framework, the cognitive services. There really are a number of different ways that we can approach this in the context of the customer. It doesn't have to be simply about if I can't write an algorithm in Python, I can't get into um, artificial intelligence. There's also a life cycle that needs to become apparent. And in this case, it might be a case of you start somewhere. Now, there are lots of different life, cycle, life cycles, guys. I've just decided to use this particular one, which is uh, from some Microsoft um, documentation, where even though we're building out a kind of data science type pipeline here, you'll start to see that there are multiple different pieces. Somebody has to essentially make sure we have good data. Somebody has to build out the pipeline. Somebody has to ultimately deploy um, some algorithms, do some model evaluation, do some model training, potentially do some feature engineering. Somebody then has to take that information and visualize it. That will drive some sort of scoring. Okay. We have to monitor this whole process. So if in many cases, if somebody is planning to do this, you'll notice that there are lots and lots of little pieces that have to be thought through in order to take this to a customer. The customer tends to think that everything nowadays is packaged, that you just put stuff in one side and hopefully it comes out with the correct analyses at the other side. That depends on the data. So even if they want to use something that is ultimately packaged, we need to make sure that their data facilitates that particular package. If they can't see into it, we at least need to be giving it decent data. So we have to consider the roles, the technologies, the life cycle in order to look internally and say, do we have the resources? Can we upskill the resources? Can we create an environment that allows us to take something to a customer that gives them an artificial intelligence life cycle, a data science life cycle, a machine learning life cycle? Okay. Or do we just give them an endpoint and say, drop your data in, and I will spit out a prediction? I'm not going to get you let anybody get away without a mathematics angle. Right. There is a reality to artificial intelligence, and that it is capability that runs as mathematics. Now, you'll see at the top of there, I've got the word dyscalculia. Now, just like dyslexia, there is a small percentage of the world, about 6%, I believe, that suffer from dyscalculia, just as there's about 6% that suffer from dyslexia. It's essentially the mathematics equivalent of dyslexia, right? where numbers seem to be in the wrong places. When you, when you look at a number, it seems to be the shape doesn't fit where it's supposed to fit and things like that. Right? So there's always going to be a group of people that just won't have the aptitude uh, for mathematics. And ultimately, it's data science is going to be difficult for them. Data machine learning is going to be difficult, not because it's heavily mathematical, but because right from the get-go, uh, people are a little bit of a disadvantage when it comes to 
the notion of what we're trying to achieve. For anyone who's happy to get into a little bit of mathematics, go off and study up some calculus, some linear algebra, probability, statistics, and optimization, and you'll tend to find that you get yourself into a really good position to go forward with data science, machine learning, and so on. Uh, somebody's just said who in the chat window. So now those it was, one of, it was me, Glenn, by the way. Oh. <laughs> I was just asking some questions. Oh, okay. Of everyone. Oh, right. Who's keen for math training? I, I bring this up not because I want everyone to become a mathematician, right? I benefit from the fact that I come from a maths background. So a lot of this, I'm not going to say seems easy for me, but it just seems a little more natural. I'm simply saying that we need to kind of understand these concepts. I don't want anybody going off and, and going through the arcane mathematical structures of why theories work or don't work and that kind of stuff. I simply want uh, anyone who's getting into the data science world, the machine learning world, and, and obviously the AI world then, to sort of go off and look at what calculus is, look at what linear algebra is. Basically understand what you're trying to achieve mathematically without getting into the complex mathematics. For instance, those little calculations that you see right there, they are part of something called the linear object trajectory model hypothesis. Okay. And if you think about it, guys, we apply this particular hypothesis constantly, all day, every day. If somebody throws a ball at you, if somebody throws a pen at you, if anyone hands you a cup of coffee, you are applying this hypothesis. You are essentially using your eyes to create a bit of a right angle. And what you're trying to do is whatever it is you're trying to catch, grab, et cetera, et cetera, stays within a particular place within that right angle so that you can comfortably catch it, grab it, and so on and so forth. Right. You can pretty much see that we are doing, as human beings, heaps and heaps of calculations all day long, every day. If someone throws a ball at you and it drops short and you don't catch it, and then they throw the ball at you again and it drops short and you don't catch it, and they do it a third time and it drops short and they don't catch it, um, then you'll start to find that you will create a probability structure in your head. You will expect the next one to drop short. Okay. So, yeah, I, I agree. This uh, Mike's just Mike Allen's just dropped something into the chat window. There is an, an edX machine learning course. There's also an edX introdu introduction to machine learning mathematics or introduction to data science mathematics, which is a mathematics course that isn't mathy at all, as Mike puts it. And I, you know, from an edX perspective, I advise you guys to go there. What it does is it essentially explains calculus to you, linear algebra, probability, and so on, so that you understand when when you read about what an algorithm does, what the algorithm is trying to achieve, without seeing all these arcane, old-fashioned mathematical formulas, which are still relevant, but maths is is more uh, mon modern nowadays. Okay. I'm not for a moment going to, to write off anybody who's still doing mathematics in the manner you're seeing it on the screen, but it's, it's, it's more modern, and it's really about understanding the maths rather than being able to write, you know, firm, or solve Fermat's last theorem or something like that. Okay. So just importantly, guys, um, just go and understand um, some of the maths that is being used and that will contribute to what you do as you as you build out um, uh, your AI solutions. Uh, there was also a question around whether it's worth it to pay for the certification worth completing it for free. Uh, from an edX perspective, it off again so we'll just wait for him to rejoin it isn't every 15 minute 
I know that was whoever throwing me off again. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you were about to say don't do certificates, and someone pushed you off. No. <laughs> um, no that, it's 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 um, in terms of this, it, it's a personal choice whether because from an edX perspective, uh, the certification is really just to give you something tangible that says you completed the course. Um, from a Microsoft perspective, obviously certification uh, will get you to places like Microsoft, you know, MCSE, MCSA, and things like that. And I, I regard them as important. You know, I'm one of those people who has a lot of these certifications. And from my perspective, there is no negative to getting certified. Um, so, you know, from an edX perspective, it's, um, it's, it's that little bit cheaper in terms of the fact that you're probably going to pay $99 for a certificate at the end of the course if you want the certificate. Um, obviously, from Microsoft certification perspective, it means doing courses, potentially taking exams. So it's, it's slightly different. But in both cases, uh, there is, for me, no negative to having uh, a certificate of achievement or a certificate of completing something. Um, whether it be a Microsoft certificate, whether it be something from edX. Guys, then the other piece is once we get beyond what we need to do and what we need to learn and how we need to skill and what we have and the ideas and how we can improve and how we can improve our customers, we obviously have to talk to our customers. So here I have this kind of weird slide where it says customers. These could be your customers. Um, or customers, especially digital natives, as I explained a little bit earlier, they want things they interact with to be smart. That's a simple reality of where we are. Okay. I do not want a, a GPS system that makes me input the same address every day. So I want the GPS system to remember things. I want it to remember the places I go to most frequently. I, you know, this this is what digital natives want. They don't expect it to be anything but, or work anything but like that. And as a result, we have to start building systems that work like that. So, in terms of your customer buy-in and engagement, we have to make sure that when we talk to customers, that the reason they want AI or the reason they want to implement AI is for good reason. Okay. In many cases, I say in many cases, in a few cases I have found that customers that I talk to are essentially um, the fear of missing out is, is the reason for getting into AI. Okay. And it's something that they just want to be a signal to clients and investors that the current, you know, the current, that they as a company are current, they're, they're trendy. They have AI and all that kind of stuff. And in many cases, it's just a, a box that needs to be checked. It doesn't really have to do anything. Obviously, um, that would be considered an easy job, <laughs> but it wouldn't have been for good reason. Okay. We have to make sure that the customer wants good AI that improves the business, that makes things better. And this is where it comes initially to data literacy and data thinking. In order to have AI, in order to have machine learning, in order to have any of the AI services and capabilities and functionality, the customer initially needs to make some sort of commitment to data literacy and data thinking. There is, it, it's the, um, you know, uh, garbage in, garbage out environment that we're talking to here. So that initial piece is really about teaching the customer the value of their data, that it's not just about gathering data for the sake of data, that it's about gathering data for the sake of improving the business. And the way we then gather the data starts to change. We have to ensure that the nature of the data, the data is good data, accurate data, clean data, sterile data, Okay, well thought through data. So that's the first lesson ultimately that we have to take with the customers. You'll tend to find that customers have a lot of data already. They're probably logging stuff, right? They probably have tools that log stuff that are producing data. They probably have customers, products, things that are being bought, things that are being sold. They probably have years and years of information that they've gathered about those things. Um, over time, 
We just need to make sure that that information can be used. The information is accurate, valuable, and can be used in the context of artificial intelligence. Okay. Then it becomes a case of you do not need to be a big boy to use AI. Size does not matter. It can be the smallest company, that five-person company that is selling, I don't know, screws and nails versus the big boys that are selling whatever they sell. Right? AI applies to anything. So it means that we look at the business, we look at their processes, we look at what they do, we look at what they produce, we kind of go, what is it I can improve? What is it I can give you that will help you to benefit from some sort of artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science capability. Okay, Like I said, guys, in many cases, some of the artificial intelligence methods are already used. Right? Generally, companies call this company intuition. There's somebody who's doing something amazing. The company just accepts it. This is the way that it's always been done. Why should we change it? But if we then tell them that we can essentially take this from whatever it is right now, to something that happens in a short space of time is automated, gives them accurate results, even potentially more accurate than they currently have, then you'll start to see that we get some buy-in. In order to get buy-in, we really have to go through a series of small steps. We don't want to believe for a moment that we can take a company from A to Z very quickly. It has to be a case of how do we integrate artificial intelligence into the company rather than get the company to become an artificial intelligence uh, environment. Okay. So we have to look at what their problems are. Importantly, we have to look at what they believe success looks like. And we have to also make sure that we never discount the value of visualization. With some of my customers, the first step is Power BI, right? I take some of their data, we look at how we can clean it up, we visualize it, we use some of the forecasting or predictive capabilities that Power BI gives us, and then we start to kind of go, you see what we've created here, trend analysis or some sort of trend capability, which gives us a little bit of forecasting capability. What if we started to do that in an automated way where I gave you a predictive piece that was more accurate than this particular trend line that we're seeing here. Okay. So we're essentially starting with visual, and we, the entire journey has now become visual to that point where we now have to build out what they already have visually in some sort of predictive capability. Okay. So never discount the value of visualization when you're, when you're talking to customers. Okay. Importantly, guys, it's all about the data. I can't emphasize this enough. I can't emphasize the importance of data literacy, data thinking, and generally the importance of data. Okay. Then, and this is just a couple of, mi couple of minutes here, guys, where we essentially need to be able to measure success. Measuring success is difficult, right? In many cases, I can throw return at in, a return at of in on investment at you and things like that. But ultimately for the customer, it is making a determination around what the metric was that needed to move, right? So what is their view of success again? So measuring success goes all the way backwards to where, to back to where you started. What is the metric we want to move? So if currently we have 200 worksheets that all resolve to a single value that is the budget for next year, okay. What is the metric we need to move? Ultimately, it's how do we get that budget without the 200 worksheets, but still using the exact same data? Then that's the metric that, need to move, that needs to move. And ultimately, if everyone agrees to that, then we've been successful. Okay. But in many cases, we have to take a step backwards with a lot of this. And these discussions need to be part of as we're going through the problems, as we're going through the obstacles, we're making decisions around the metric that needs to move. In many cases with many companies, the company has no idea what metric needs to move, or they disagree on the metric that needs to move. So there might be multiple of them, and the movement might change over time as well. 
but it's important that we tie people down to a single metric, as in we've gone from 200 worksheets to a 10-minute algorithm, and ultimately then achieved success. And then we can evaluate things like return on investment and so on and so forth. There's going to be, there's a reality to, to a lot of this, guys, that in many cases, as we apply AI, people within companies have to upskill, right? So the reality then becomes a case of we don't really want to upskill. But there's a learning curve with everything, and people have to embrace this. And that goes to, you know, whether companies identify people that are become obstacles, or whether companies identify people that don't take the business forward from an AI perspective, or people who are not prepared to sort of jump on the learning curve because someone has to, beyond this being implemented, it needs to be supported, it needs to be maintained, it needs to be updated and retrained and so on and so forth. That generally will be a combination of the customer and the partner. But ultimately what it leads to is success. So guys, if there are any questions, um, this is an opportunity. There's sort of nine minutes before we're supposed to uh, close things down. But if there are any custom, uh, questions, sorry, please uh, feel free to drop them into the chat window. Or um, remember, too, that to, if you can't think of anything right now, we do have the Yammer facility. Uh, importantly, guys, it's now about essentially you guys evaluating what you do, looking at what you can essentially package as IP, looking at what you can take to customers. You guys have... I think he's been cut off again. Um, but I'm just going to pop the, um, the AI practice Yammer group in the IM window for everyone whilst we wait for him to connect back. Hopefully everyone's been on there. Had a few conversations with a few of you um, throughout the weeks. Um, uh, Glenn's back. There we go. Oh, yeah. So, guys, I was just saying that you guys, in many cases, know exactly what your customers need. I know that in many cases it takes a bit of convincing, um, but in many cases, you know, you, you'll find that you already know what your customers' problems are, where the obstacles are, what could be automated, what could be made more intelligent, made different. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to run in and they're all going to agree and everyone's going to be happy. But once again, small steps, um, education about artificial intelligence, potentially build it out yourselves in, in Azure and then show them a demonstration. One of the way, it's one of the approaches that I use where I just, essentially because of the pricing, I, build, I just build things and I kind of go, you know that data that you guys have sitting there that does X? Look what I can do with uh, it. David, uh, your question is very, very relevant, okay, and that's um, how do we sort of deal with the, some of the privacy issues about putting data into artificial intelligence on Azure. Now, that question is um, <laughs> privacy, <laughs> privacy in the cloud can be easier than on a local insecure server. I agree with you, Mike, and I also agree with you, David. Uh, sometimes the, the, the the moving data to sort of a service that is offshore, and to be to be frank with you, a couple of the um, a few of the uh, artificial intelligence services in Azure are not hosted here in in Australia, and that will mean moving data. If you plan to use them, it will mean moving your data offshore. And then it's not so much an insecurity issue; it's more of a compliance issue in some cases. So I do understand that. Uh, in some cases, it's just not going to be doable until that service runs in Australia. So, yeah, so David, uh, who, who was just indicated that he's involved with banking, um, you know, I understand that there's going to be some data that you can't run through some, like some of the AI tools that are hosted offshore, but there's going to be data that you can. Um, the other side of that is uh, potentially or, or Mike says, de-identify your data. That's one way of doing it. Um, you know, to be to be honest, that's that's not necessarily a 
bad suggestion because in some some cases you can redact or, or, or uh, change a lot of the personal data, but you still sort of have the numbers as such, and it's the numbers that may drive the the, the prediction or the solution. So in many cases, yeah, ultimately, um, you know, it's it's about kind of understanding exactly a where the service is running. Um, what the compliances are around it. Uh, somebody's just posted the. Um, it was me. It was the me. The trust center. Okay. <laughs> yep. So yeah, the trust center is is, is a good uh, place to go to. But I do understand that sometimes it's it's not even about the information or the type. It's just the reluctance um, to have data offshore. You know, I've, been, I've it's it's one of the things that. Uh, I deal with a lot. People tend to feel like they, you know, that they like they want everything local or in within Australia. The other option, guys, is to understand that, you know, if you stand up a, for instance, HD Inside cluster running our server, or if you created a um, virtual machine running R in Sydney or Melbourne within a you could still use the Python capabilities that Microsoft gives you. You could still use the R capabilities that Microsoft gives you. It just means that you're using the cloud inside Australia. You're just not using any services that are offshore or hosted external of Australia. So there are ways around it that it doesn't have to be about just using Azure Machine Learning. You could use our server, grab a machine learning Python, I mean a machine learning package, run your data through that package, uh, you know, in a HD inside cluster hosted in Australia, or a virtual machine hosted in Australia. And then, you know, once a particular service that you want to use is hosted in Australia, just move the functionality into, uh, into the cloud. There really shouldn't be, a, you know, the, I understand the reasons why you might not want to do something, but there's, you know, there's, there's many ways to skin a cat as such in the context of, um, of artificial intelligence and the cloud. It seems like that is everyone. So if that is the case, guys, um, once again, thank you. Uh, I hope you all have a very good um, rest of Friday afternoon and a very good weekend. Please, uh, if there are any more questions, reach out on Yammer, um, and we'll do our best to sort of get information to you. Remember, the uh, learning capabilities are out there around uh, AI School, Learn Analytics, edX. And yeah, just post any questions or any guidance that you might need along the way, and I'll do my best to help you. Thanks again. Have a good afternoon.